Let's move on to the complex carbohydrate section now. So let's talk about oligosaccharides. Remember that oligosaccharides are going to be slightly larger. They're going to be composed of between three to 10 monosaccharide units that are bound together. Now for many oligosaccharides that come in our diet, we actually do not have the enzymes to break them apart. So that is sometimes why many oligosaccharides are referred to as flatulent sugars. Uh, and this is referring to the fact that we don't have the enzymes to break them apart, but some of our microbes do. And in the process of that microbial metabolism, sometimes they produce gas, <clears throat> flatulence. So here are three different examples of some oligosaccharides. So here's inulin. This is um, a type of oligosaccharide that is found in chicory root, Jerusalem artichoke. And so we see it has some different kinds of um, glycosidic bonds in it. Over here is stachyose which is found in legumes. And over here is raffinose. So raffinose is a type of oligosaccharide that is found in legumes, in cruciferous veggies, in whole grains. And it is composed of galactose plus sucrose with these alpha-1-6 linkages. Now humans don't have the enzymes in order to hydrolyze these alpha-1-6 linkages. So this is why raffinose are, is sometimes considered a flatulent sugar. However, you can take a product called Beano. Beano is um, a product that is uh, formed by an enzyme that is um, contained, that is produced by fun fungi, by, by a mushroom enzyme. And this mushroom enzyme is alpha glycosidase, and it has the ability to hydrolyze these alpha 1 6 linkages. So that, that is a product that can help you digest this raffinose oligosaccharide. Now, another category of oligosaccharides are called dextrins. Dextrins are going to be um, glucose several glucose molecules all bound together with those same alpha-1-4 linkages um, that uh, occur from partially hydrolyzed starch. So we haven't gotten to starch yet, but suffice it to know that starch is composed of many uh, glucose molecules all bound together. In the process of digesting starch, we'll take the big, huge starch and break it down into smaller components called dextrins. So dextrins would be in that three to 10 monosaccharide glucose length. Um, now, sometimes in uh, food production, we will use dextrins as a source of a food additive. So if you are ever taking a look at some ingredients list and you see things like maltodextrin or corn syrup solids or hydrolyzed corn starch, those are all examples of dextrins. Okay, we have now moved on to polysaccharides. Poly meaning many, so polysaccharides are gonna be more than 10 monosaccharides all bound together. Now, polysaccharides, they can have varying structures. They can either be linear, like I've represented here, or they can be branched, and they can be branched with, by using different types of glycosidic bonds. Now, something that's important to point out about polysaccharides is that only the terminal ends of the polysaccharides are accessible to enzymes. So enzymes can't start um, performing hydrolysis on monosaccharides that are in the middle. They can only work on the terminal ends. Now the digestibility of a polysaccharide is gonna depend on what kind of glycosidic linkages it has. Um, so as we talk further, sometimes these glycosidic link linkages are uh, in, the, in a shape that allow the enzymes we have to hydrolyze them, other kinds don't. Now, polysaccharides, they can be naturally occurring in many foods, or we can add them to food. And polysaccharides are gonna be a storage form of carbohydrate. So we've talked about already about how glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrate in animals. So in humans, we have glycogen stores in our liver and in our muscle. Um, and then in plants, uh, starch is the glycogen, or uh, starch is the uh, carbohydrate storage. So starch is kind of like the plant equivalent of glycogen. So let's talk a little bit more about starch. So starch is a polysaccharide form of storage for carbohydrate in plants. And so uh, different types of plants like cereal grains, potatoes, legumes, other vegetables, they will all contain starch. Now enzymes, as I mentioned before, can only act on the free ends of the polysaccharide uh, starch. Now there's poly uh, starch comes in kind of two different formats. The first format is called amylose, and that's what we see here. Amylose is a nice, long, linear chain of glucose molecules all bound together with these alpha-1,4 linkages. 
So here's a picture of amylose, nice and linear. Um, and the enzyme amylase can break down these alpha-1,4 linkages, can hydrolyze these alpha-1,4 linkages in amylose. Again, only working from the terminal ends. Um, and in humans, we have amylase in our saliva, so we can start a little bit of uh, amylose car uh, digestion in our mouth, and then the pancreas also produces amylase that it will secrete into the small intestine. Now, the other form of polysaccharide that, that is part of starch is called amylopectin. And amylopectin is branched. So it has some linear components. The linear portions also have these same alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages. But then they also have some branch points. And the types of bonds that we have at these branch points are alpha-1,6 glycosidic linkages. So um, amylase that I mentioned before, the enzyme, can only hydrolyze the alpha-1,4 linkages. We need a different kind of enzyme that is able to hydrolyze these alpha-1,6 linkages. And so the enzyme that can, that can hydrolyze the alpha-1,6 linkages are, is called dextrinase. And we get dextrinase from the pancreas. Um, so that is, uh, we won't be able to hydrolyze any of this amylopectin. Oops. We won't be able to hydrolyze any of this amylopectin when we're in the mouth, but we can start to digest that amylopectin when we are in the small intestine. Now, one of the things about am amylopectin is that since it is branched, it means it has more terminal ends. And since the enzymes can only act on the terminal ends, that means that we can hydrolyze this amylopectin faster because there's more places that enzymes can be working at one time. So ultimately what will happen is that that will increase our blood glucose concentration faster because we can digest the amylopectin faster since there are more terminal ends. Now, when we're looking at starchy plants, they generally have a one to four ratio of amylose to amylopectin. And now glycogen, we have talked about glycogen already. So glycogen is referred to as the animal starch and glycogen is highly branched. So here's a structure of glycogen. We can see there's lots and lots of different branches in here. Um, and it's gonna be the same story with glycogen in that the enzymes can only hydrolyze glucose off of the terminal ends of glycogen. So the fact that glycogen is so branched is also really a benefit because that means that when our, um, when our hormones are stimulating glycogen uh, gl uh, glycogenolysis, when we're breaking apart glycogen, that that will rapidly increase our blood glucose concentration. Um, and so the glycogen that we store in the liver, its function is really to be a, a storage form of uh, glucose that we can release quickly in response to hypoglycemia. Um, whereas in the muscle, the glycogen is available as a quick source of glucose to fuel muscle contractions during really high intensity activity. So now we, we're still talking about polysaccharides, but I want to be able to compare and contrast starch versus fiber. So both starch and fiber are polysaccharides, many, um, many monosaccharides bound together, but they have different kinds of glycosidic bonds. Um, so the types of bonds that we have in starch, so for example, in amylopectin, those are alpha-1,4 bonds and alpha-1,6 bonds. Humans have the enzymes to hydrolyze those types of bonds. Whereas if we look at different kinds of fiber, they have different kinds of uh, glycosidic bonds that humans do not have the enzymes to, um, to hydrolyze. So here I've drawn an example of a type of fiber called beta-glucan. This specific conformation of beta-glucan is um, it's found in cereal grains like oats, for example. And so these, um, these glycosidic linkages are beta-1,3 and beta-1,4 bonds. Humans do not have the enzymes to uh, hydrolyze these types of bonds. So this is one of the characteristics that makes beta-glucan a type of fiber. So the definition of fiber are all plant polysaccharides and lignans which are resistant to hydrolysis by digestive enzymes of man. So looking at dietary fiber, humans can't digest or absorb fiber. So really fiber doesn't provide any appreciable energy to the diet. And um, this is because it turns out, in fact, some fiber can be um, digested or metabolized by microbes and we can in turn absorb some of their metabolites so we can get a little bit of energy from that but it's variable depending on the type of fiber as well as the particular population of microbes that you have in your gut.
Now, what are the different ways we can characterize dietary fiber? It can be through the chemical composition. Um, so some examples are cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, pectins, gums. Um, we can also characterize dietary fiber based on its physical properties, so whether it is soluble or insoluble. And we can also characterize dietary fiber based on whether or not it, it can be fermented by microbes in the gut. So that is our overview about carbohydrate structure. So again, remember that carbohydrates have this ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen of one to two to one, the hydrate of carbon. Um, we can divide our carbohydrates into simple and complex. Simple carbohydrates are the monosaccharides. They come in those three flavors of glucose, fructose, and galactose. Simple carbohydrates also include the disaccharides, maltose, lactose, and whoop, maltose, lactose, and sucrose. And remember that maltose is two glucose together. Uh, lactose is a glucose plus a galactose. And then sucrose is a glucose plus a fructose. Then over here, we have our complex carbohydrates, which can be divided into the oligosaccharides, which are uh, three to 10 monosaccharides bound together, and to the polysaccharides, which are more than 10 monosaccharides bound together. Polysaccharides come in the forms of starches, which we do have the enzymes to digest glycogen, which is the animal storage form of carbohydrate, and fibers, which humans do not have the enzymes to digest. And that is it for the structure of carbohydrates.